<coughs> All right. Hey, Blessed Up Baptist Church. Um, glad to be preaching to you, even though it's uh, via live streaming today. I had uh, recorded my, I already preached a sermon. I recorded it before and the camera failed. So this is my second time preaching it. Okay. So if I sound a little tired, that's, that's the reason why. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, Brother David uh, couldn't uh, preach tonight and uh, the other preachers were unavailable. So, um, you know, I've worked on a, on a sermon for you guys and I, I hope it's a uh, blessing to you. So please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, and the title for the sermon this evening is, Let Us in the Book of Hebrews. That might not make a lot of sense right now, but Let Us in the Book of Hebrews, and you'll soon understand what I'm talking about here. So if you go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 1, Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 1, the very first word says, Let Us, okay, Let Us. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'll be going to all uh, the uh, times in the book of Hebrews that it says, let us. And we're going to look at what is it that Paul is striving that the Hebrews do, okay? And so there's many references to this let us. So that's why it's called let us in the book of Hebrews, okay? So we're just sticking to the book of Hebrews and we're seeing what we're being called to do by Paul the Apostle here. I believe it's Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. And what you'll notice is we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, then Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. The first let us are about salvation. So it's more about someone that is unsaved, someone that's hearing about Christ and wanting to know his way to heaven. That's what the first two let us is about. So if we look at verse number 1, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay, look at verse number two. And what is this fearing about? Because it says in verse number two, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay, so what is this that we should fear? Let us therefore fear. Now this is speaking to an unsaved Hebrew. Okay, there should be concern, there should be fear, for your eternal future. You know, what is going to happen after you live this life, when you pass away, what is going to happen to your soul? You know, most people in this world have some level of concern where they're going to be after this life. And listen, when you go door to the soul winning and you ask people, are you 100% sure that your soul would be in heaven? Most often than not, they will say, I'm not sure. I hope so, but I'm not sure. They don't have that confidence, okay? And so there ought to be a fear about this truth, right? And it's this fear that will drive you to find out, well, what is it that I need to do? What is the answer? How can I be sure of going to heaven? Now, notice when it says in verse number one, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, okay? What is salvation? How can we be sure of going to salvation? It's called rest, okay? So, of course, as you know, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, you know this very well, that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works, okay? God could not call salvation rest if it was you trying to work your way to salvation, okay? Work is, rest is the opposite to work, okay? And so when the Bible says here that we will enter into His rest, it's because salvation is not of God, okay? And as you could see very clearly, verse number 2 speaks about the gospel being preached. And so therefore, the very first let us, let us therefore fear, is for the unsaved person, and it's so important that if you're somebody that does attend Blessed Hope Baptist Church and you don't know if you're saved, if you don't know how to go to heaven, you still have doubts, then you should have a healthy dose of fear and you should be asking, what is it that I need to do? And brethren, it's faith on Jesus Christ alone. It is resting in Christ. It is not of works. Drop down to verse number 11 now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let's get to the second let us. It says here, let us labor... Therefore, to enter into that rest. So the second let us is let us labor. Once again, this is for an unsaved person, okay? Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall under the same example of unbelief. Okay, so what is it that causes us to not enter into the rest? It said there, the example of unbelief. So if you don't believe the gospel, you don't believe what Jesus Christ has done for you, his death, burial, and resurrection, if you have unbelief, then you will not enter into that rest. We must mix faith with the gospel. When you hear the gospel, you must place your faith on Jesus Christ. But the question comes up, and, and those that want to teach you a false gospel, those that want to teach you a works-based gospel, will look at verse number 11, where it says, let us labor, 
say, well, see, what's Pastor Kevin laboring, right? That's doing work. You know, you've got to work your way to heaven. You've got to have a workspace gospel. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. How can we rest if we're laboring, though? What, what is this laboring all about? And now, I can understand how it can sound like works, okay? So please keep your finger there. And actually, actually before, before we turn away from there, I just want to show you that this is not works. It can, the laboring here cannot be working your way to heaven. Because if you look at verse number 10, the verse before, verse number 11, it says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also have ceased from his own works, okay, as God did from his. Okay, so how do we enter into the rest? We cease from our own works. We don't work, right? Salvation is not of works. If you're trusting your works to go to heaven, cease from trusting those works. Stop doing the works. That's not going to get you to heaven. You know, enter into the rest by faith. And so if verse number 10 is saying cease from your works, then obviously verse number 11, when it says let us labor, it's not saying you've got to work. Otherwise, there'd be a contradiction in the Bible. Okay, so whoever's teaching you that nonsense, they're a false prophet, they're a heretic, please don't listen to that kind of teaching. Well, we do want to understand what we have to labor to do, though, right? In order to be saved, what kind of labor is there? So please keep your finger there and go to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And let's go to verse number 23. And I, I know some of these verses can be difficult to sort of process in your mind. But obviously, uh, many of these things that seem like a works-based gospel, normally if you just read the context, you understand what's going on in the story. It, may, it makes perfect sense, okay? So in Luke chapter 13, verse 23... It says here, Then said one unto him, so what, someone, one of his disciples comes to Jesus, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, before we, before we see what Jesus says, my question to you, brethren, just think about this, is it few that are saved? And I think absolutely. I think if you're a saved person, you know the gospel, you know that absolutely it's very few people that are saved, okay? So then what does Jesus say in verse number 24? Uh, yeah, and he said unto them, verse number 24, Strive to enter at that straight gate. Strive, not strive, to put a great effort in, okay? To, to, and look, it's no different to let us labor. When it says strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able, okay? So laboring or striving is the seeking of the truth, right? Once you have that fear, let us therefore fear. Let us be concerned about our future. Where are we going to be? Are we going to end up in heaven and in hell? The next question is, well, what is the gospel? I need to understand. What is it, okay? Now, why do many people have to labor? Why do many people have to strive? Well, first of all, when I got saved, I grew up in a Christian home. My mother gave me the gospel at four years old. Brethren, I barely had to strive for anything, right? It was actually very easy for me, right? Growing up, I, that's all I knew. Jesus died for me. It was a gospel, yes, not of works. I understood that we're all sinners. We can't make it on our own. And it was simple, childlike faith on Jesus Christ that saved me, okay? Now, that was easy for me. I probably just, I, I don't know. I can't remember what being four years old. I probably heard the gospel once clearly. I understood it. Going to church, you hear all this stuff. Makes a lot of sense, right? But then... My wife, you know, when I gave the gospel to my wife, I think it took her like two months to get saved. It took her some time. Why? Because she had to strive. She had to labor. She was a Roman Catholic. You know, she believed in a false gospel. She believed in another Jesus. She had a different faith, a different religion. And so she had to labor. She had to strive. She had to uh, re uh, put away those things that she was taught. She had to put away her bad faith. She had to uh, understand that the Jesus she's been praying to, the Mary that she's been praying to, is not a biblical Jesus. It's not the biblical Mary. And so it, it required great effort for her to understand the truth. It's no different to a man who's relying on his own righteousness to be saved. Oh, I'm saved because I'm a good person. Well, that person has to labor. He has to strive to give up those false beliefs. Right? That's not going to get them saved and make the effort to know the truth, learn the truth, find the truth, and be able to transfer their faith from what was false to their faith onto something that is true, the true gospel. And so for many people, yeah, they have to strive. You know, for many people, they have to hear the gospel once, twice, three times, four times before it's, it clicks and it makes sense and they're able to then rest in Jesus Christ. So the striving is learning the gospel. The striving is, you know, being able to give up the false beliefs. But once you do understand the gospel, hey, it's rest. It's faith. It's not of works. It's easy. Jesus did all the hard work. And so that's what it's teaching us here. The laboring is the learning of the truth, understanding, accepting the truth, 
rejecting the false beliefs that you once held. Now, if you can please go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, we'll go to our third letter, verse number 14. It says, uh, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us, there it is, hold fast our profession. So now that you are saved, all right, now that you have entered into the rest, let us hold fast our profession. What are we professing? Well, what's the verse saying there right now? That we have a great high priest. We don't need to go to some priest to get close to God. Hey, God is our high priest. Jesus Christ is God. All right. And, and so we have Jesus Christ as the mediator between God and man. But not only is Jesus Christ our high priest, which is passed into heaven, it says Jesus, the Son of God. Listen, this is part of our profession. In order for you to be saved, you must understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, when the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, uh, desired to get baptized, and, uh, and uh, uh, which disciple was it? Uh, Philip. Philip said to him, you know, do you believe with all your heart? You know, what did, what did the Ethiopian eunuch say? He says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, salvation is believing that Jesus is not just God, but the Son of God. Okay, the Son of God. And so when it's telling us here, hold fast our profession, holding fast is to be stable, okay, to, to be strong. Now, brother, brother Anthony on Sunday preached about the Trinity and preached, you know, how, how oneness is a heretical doctrine. You know, that, that teaching that says, well, Jesus is God the Father and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. No, that's not the profession that we've been asked to hold on to. That's a heresy. That's not true. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Once you are saved, you place your faith on the Son. That is the profession that you are to hold on to. And brethren, the reason why we've been asked to hold fast is because sometimes some Christians can be ashamed. They can be afraid to tell people what they believe. Right? And if you're ashamed, if you're not holding fast, you're not going to be an effective witness for Christ. You're not going to be able to tell other people how you entered into the rest and, and show people how they can enter into that rest. And so it's holding fast our profession, actually it's our profession of faith. Okay, Because I want to show you this again. This let us hold fast our profession is actually mentioned twice in the book of Hebrews. Keep your finger there, but go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 23. Let's have a look at this as well. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse number 23, so I, I am going in order in the book of Hebrews, but because Hebrews 10 is saying the same thing, so I'm bringing that in here in the same area. Let us hold our fast our profession. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, okay? Without wavering, okay? That's not being unsettled. We don't have to wonder now, are we saved? Am I, am I going to heaven? You know, maybe I'm not going to heaven. No, once you understand the gospel, once you understand that it, once you're saved, you're always saved. Jesus paid for all your sins. He paid for the sins of the day you die. They've been done with. They've been crucified on the cross with Christ. He's done it all. You don't have to waver. Because it says here, for he is faithful that promised. God is faithful. He promised you salvation. He promised you eternal life. You don't have to waver. You know, you can have full confidence in your salvation by your profession of faith, okay? You call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you've made a profession, you've called upon Him as the Son of God, you've believed on Him, and you can hold fast that profession. Now, what's strange about this, brethren? You know, I've heard in, in some of my churches in the past, and look, I'm not attacking my churches in the past because I've loved them, they, they've, done, uh, they've helped me in different ways, but you can see that this is something, when we talk about the profession of faith, it's talking about a believer, and they want the believer not to waver. They want that believer, you can see here, to have that confidence, right? And, and unfortunately, there are many churches that if, if they're doubting someone's salvation, they'll say something like this, well, that person made a profession of faith, okay? Now, biblically, yeah, that means they're saved, <laughs> okay? Biblically, that means they should be established and not wavering in their belief. They should have the confidence that they are saved. But within those churches, when they say that, yeah, he's just made a profession of faith, what they're saying is, well, I don't know if he's really saved. He says he is. He says his place is faith on Jesus, but I don't really know. And I'll only know if he starts coming to church and if he starts reading his Bible and if he starts praying and if he starts to clean up his life and he starts doing good works, then I'll know, then I'll know that person is actually saved. And so many churches today use this term professional faith as a in-between. We still don't know if he's saved or not, which is just stupidity. You know, when we see here in the, in the book of Hebrews, no, the profession of faith is confirmation that you are saved. It ought to give you stability, not instability. Okay, so let's be true to the Word of God in how He uses this term, the profession of your faith. 
Now back to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16. Let's go to the next let us. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. All right. So this is about praying. This is about, obviously, we can't approach God's throne physically. This is about going to God in prayer. And God wants us to come boldly. Okay, come boldly. And listen, if you don't pray, because look, look what happens. It says that you may obtain mercy. You know, sometimes we need God's mercy. We need His help and find grace. We need His grace to help in the time of need. We have needs. We need God to answer those needs. You know what it's saying here? If we don't pray, we're not going to obtain mercy. We're not going to find grace. And we're not going to have our needs met. Okay, and listen, praying is something that is easy to uh, forget. It's easy to not take seriously. But God wants us to go to His throne, you know, with boldness. You know, and 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 we need help, Reverend. We can't think that you know oh, I, I'm just too good. I'm a mature Christian. I, you know, look how righteous I am, and I'm doing all these things. You know, you are a needy person. You sin. You've already sinned today. You sin every day. You sin to the day that you die. Okay, you got your, that's a reality. You're a weak, fallen human being. You've got a sinful nature, and we need help. Okay, we live in times of trouble. I'm not even talking about the COVID-19. We think we're normal. We're still having tribulations, difficulties, things that we need God's help with. Now, sometimes we don't go and pray because we're ashamed. Okay, and I've had that feeling. Maybe you have too. Well, you have sin in your life and you've done wrong and you know, man, God's so angry at me and God probably can be angry at you many times, right? And you're like, how can I face him? How can I go to his throne boldly? Well, this is why, because in the previous verse in Hebrews 4.15, it says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so Jesus Christ knows what it's like. Okay, he knows what it's like to have infirmities. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He's been a human being. He's seen the suffering of man. He took upon his own body the infirmities. He took upon his own body our sins. All the temptation. Jesus is familiar with the struggles that we have. And then it says, because Jesus is familiar with these things, verse number 16, let us therefore come boldly. That's why we can come boldly, because Jesus knows what it's like. God knows what it's like. He knows that we have need of Him. He knows that we're going to come before His throne as sinful creatures, you know, uh, asking for His help. So don't forget your prayer life. Can you please go to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 1? Hebrews chapter 6, let's go on to the next let us. Let us. He Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go unto perfection. Okay, let us go on to perfection. Now, listen, this is not saying let us stop sinning. Let's become sinless, perfect, you know, perfected. No, that's not what perfection is. Perfection is complete, mature. Okay, in the context of this, is bas it's basically uh, uh, becoming a full adult, you know, becoming mature, not being a baby in Christ. And so when it talks about here, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, we'll soon see what some of those are. This is basically saying at, at, there comes a time in your, in your Christian life that you ought to grow. You can't remain a little babe, a little child, okay? You need to grow and develop. But part of that growth is that you learn the principles of the doctrine of Christ. In other words, saying is it's the fundamentals, the foundational things, okay? We need to make sure we understand these things before we desire something more. What are some examples given to us here? It says, uh, not laying, in verse number one, not laying, again, the foundation of repentance from dead works, all right? So will dead works ever get us saved, right? If, if we're trying to work our way to heaven, okay, if, if they, we think that's part of the gospel, God calls that dead works. And so we need to repent from those dead works, okay? We must not go back and think, well, maybe works is part of salvation. It never was, you know? That's something that we need to settle, get it down, lock it in, nail it in, brethren. We need to nail in these fundamental truths so we can grow. If you can't nail in the fundamental things, you're never going to grow, all right, what else? And of faith toward God, that's salvation. It's repentance from trust in the works. Put your faith in the Lord. Verse number two, of the doctrine of baptism. So as soon as you're saved, you should get baptized. That's a very fundamental thing. On the, and of the laying of, and of hands, that's the ordination process of pastors and deacons and things alike. And of the resurrection of the dead. So hey, you know, I mean, I, I know the timing of the rapture, you know, the end times in, in a very uh, detailed way is the meat of the Word of God. But understanding that one day these bodies will die and God will give us a new resurrected body, that's an easy thing to understand, 
okay? God not only saved our soul, not only did we have a regenerated spirit, but He's going to give us a brand new body at the resurrection, at the rapture, okay? So that's a fundamental thing, and of eternal judgment, okay? And of eternal judgment. So obviously those that uh, die without Christ have an eternity in hell, in the lake of fire. These are fundamental truths. These are things that are, are basic. We need to understand these things. Once we understand these things, then we can go on to perfection. Then we can cont continue to grow and mature. We don't always need to go back to the basic things, brethren. If, if you do find yourself not knowing these truths, you better learn them. You know, some other fundamental truths is the virgin birth. You know, other, you know, the Trinity, Jesus, the Son of God. You know, these are fundamental things. You know, that Christ was born 2,000 years ago. You know, um, what else? The blood atonement of Jesus Christ. These are all fundamental things of the faith. The, you know, the, um, the inerrancy of the Bible. You know, being able to believe what the Bible says. You know, not trying to turn the miracles into some figurative, you know, fairy tale. No, these, th these events are true. These things happen. These are all fundamental truths that allow us to move on and serve the Lord. Now, in order to understand this a little bit better, we need to go back to the previous chapter, right at the end of the previous chapter, because then chapter 6 kind of picks up from there, right? So let's backtrack to Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12, because the Hebrews are being uh, rebuked by Paul here. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12, it says, For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So that first principles, again, it's those principles of Christ, those very fundamental things, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Okay? So the fundamental doctrines are the milk of the word of God. Verse number 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Full age is talking about an adult. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so when the Bible is telling us to go on unto perfection, it's saying, listen, it's stop, it, stop being a child. Stop, you know, start learning the fundamental things. Don't go and, don't go and just uh, eat strong meat. Get grounded in the milk of God's word. Once you've grounded yourself, once you've nailed in those core doctrines, then you can go on and believe those more uh, meaty doctrines in the Bible. This is the mistake that many cults, many false religions make, right? That they, 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 uh, they, they go for the strong meats, so-called, but they haven't uh, drunk the milk. They haven't gone to the fundamental things. One thing that I learned that's very important in my Christian life, uh, learning the Bible, is that I have to lock in those fundamental truths. Once they're locked in, every other thing is built upon those things. Okay. Once you understand salvation and you can't lose it, and you read a passage that may sound like you can lose your salvation, well, you know what? Well, that can't be true. The interpretation can't be that you can lose your salvation because I've already built the foundation which says I cannot. It's everlasting life. And then you can say, well, what are the other options for this verse and for this passage? And so learning those fundamental truths will allow you to go on and be an adult. Can you please now turn to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. We'll go to the next letters, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 22. The Bible reads, <clears throat> let us draw near. So this is talking about going uh, near to the Lord, coming close to the Lord, right? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, okay? So in order for us to draw near to the Lord, there's a few things we need to do. Have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Yeah, what is that about? Well, obviously when you were saved, you know, spiritually speaking, you were sprinkled by the blood of Christ. Okay, it's the blood of Christ that allowed us to enter into that new covenant. And then it says, in our bodies washed with pure water. What this, is, this is not teaching. This is not teaching that you've got to have a shower or a bath before you can fellowship with God. Okay? This is not teaching you have to be baptized. Okay, baptism, it, it, that's, not the, that's not what this is referring to, okay? This is obviously speaking about a spiritual thing, all right? Being sprinkled by the blood of Christ and having our bodies washed. The reason it says here our bodies washed with pure water is because the Old Testament uh, priests, you know, before serving in the tabernacle in the temple, they had these rituals, they had these things that they had to uh, do. So they had, you know, they had to wash everything, their clothes themselves. And the purpose was that so they could serve the Lord, so they could, you know, be that uh, help to, to the nation of Israel to be able to offer their sacrifices to the Lord. And of course, the Lord's presence was in the tabernacle, in the temple in those days. And so what that pictured, you know, that, that, that washing that the priest did, what that pictured was, of course, the, the uh, you know, the, the body of Jesus Christ, which is without blemish, without spot, okay, that Jesus Christ is without sin. And so that was a picture of 
the ultimate sacrifice, which would be the Lord Jesus Christ, but also a picture of ourselves, you know, in the New Testament being kings and priests, and we positionally before God being without spot, without sin, because of Christ's uh, blood atonement. And so that's what the purpose was. And so when it talks about here, let us draw near, it's speaking about, hey, let us have a fellowship with God. Let's walk with God. Let's spend time with the Lord. And please keep your finger there and go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5. Because, brethren, as your pastor, I want you to have a close walk with God. I really do. I really want you to know God very personally. Okay? It's not just enough to hear preaching, which is wonderful. It's not just enough to be in church, which is wonderful. But you having your own time with the Lord, you know, your own quiet time with Him, your own fellowship with Him is so critical to your life. It'll give you great joy. And I want you to have that great joy. But in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Okay? And so what this is teaching us, you, when you go through the rest of this chapter, it's teaching that the darkness is basically sin, okay? So God has no sin. God cannot sin, okay? We know that already. Let's go to verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth, okay? So if you tell me that you, you're having sweet fellowship with God, but you're in the middle of some sin, right? You know, you're just living a wicked, sinful lifestyle. The Bible's telling me you're lying to me, okay? You lie, okay? We cannot have fellowship with God while we have sin, okay? You say, well, the sins were taken care of. Yes, positionally before God, we have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. Praise God. But I'm talking about our, our spiritual walk. Our daily walk with God is what we're talking about here. And of course, every day we're going to sin to the day we die. So let's, how do we fix this up? In verse number seven, but if we walk in the light, so that's if we walk without sin, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You say, well, hold on here. It says we've got to walk in the light. So does that, are you saying, Pastor Kevin, that we, we, we can uh, have no sin? Well, no, let's keep going. Let's understand. Now, listen, in order for you to fellowship with God, you better have no sin. That's what you have to do. But let's keep going. It says in verse number 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Say, so, well, that sounds contradictive. Walk in the light, but now you're saying that I have sin. I can't, well, what's going on? Well, look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 answers it all. If we confess our sins, <laughs> He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? So that's how we're cleansed by Jesus Christ in our spiritual walk. We confess our sins. Verse number 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. And so, brethren, what this is teaching us is, in order for you to have sweet fellowship with God, you better get down, go boldly, like we saw, before the throne of grace and ask the Lord, Lord, I failed again. You know, it's a sinful flesh. Please forgive me. You know, please help me have victory over these sins and just realize this is going to be your life to the day you die, okay? And you can ask for forgiveness. Jesus Christ, you know, he's already paid for all of your sins. But hey, at that moment, you confess your sins, you can have sweet fellowship with God. With the Lord. I personally recommend, even before coming, I do this as a pastor, before I preach, I confess my sins before I preach. Because if, if, I'm, if, I'm, sin, if, I, if I'm in a state of unconfessed sin in my life, how effective do you think am I going to be really, you know, to preach God's Word, you know, having the Holy Ghost? It's, it's, it's going to be interrupted, that fellowship. And so I, I personally believe before you come to church, you should just spend a moment, even on your drive, if that's what you've got, and just confess your sins to the Lord, ask Him to forgive you, ask Him to, you want to have fellowship with you, because God, that's where God wants to meet, meet us, you know, in, in, at, at church. And so look, let's look at verse number 24 now, Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, and verse number 24. We'll go to the next let us. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The next one is, let us consider one another. All right, so this is, this is interesting because, you know, uh, why do we come to church? Well, why is it that we desire to be in the house of the Lord? And of course, look, I'm not saying that me preaching to this camera on live stream is church. That's not church. You know, unfortunately, as I said, we couldn't meet tonight, but I didn't want you to go without a Bible sermon. Okay? I wanted you to uh, hear the Word of God. And so, here's the thing though, you know, when we come to church, you know, you might say, well, I go to church because the Lord commands, praise God. You know, I go to church because I want to worship and praise God. Praise God for that, yeah, amen. You know, I go to church because I want to be edified. I want to hear the preaching of God's word. I want to make changes in my life. Praise God. I want to sing His praises. Praise God. But another thing that should drive you to go to church is that you can consider another, consider your brethren and provoke them unto love and to good works. 
Listen, provoke, you know, it's not about provoking people to frustration, okay? You know, wh- I mean, what kind of brother or sister are you in the Lord exactly? You know, when people think about you, do they think, oh, this is my brother, this is my sister in the Lord who, who uh, you know, provokes me to love? You know, I, I know they love me and they encourage me to love others. You know, they provoke me to do some good works, to offer my sacrifices of praise to God, to go soul winning, to serve Him. Or are you, the, are you the person that people say, man, that person frustrates me. He provokes me to frustration. He provokes me to evil works. You know, listen, we need to clean, if that's you, you need to fix this up, right? Let us consider. This is how you do it. You know, when you're provoking others in a negative way, it's usually because you're trying to fill yourself up with some, I don't know, pride, you know, thinking highly of yourself. You know, no, no, we come to church to edify one another. You know, the body, we're the body of Christ. We're there to work together, to be unified, to have one mind, to serve one another. That's how we grow. You know, that's what we're, you know, called to do. Let us consider one another. Now, let's keep going. Verse number 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner, manner of some is, but exhorting, exhorting is, uh, you know, building one another up, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as we see, you know, the end times and Jesus Christ coming back, more and more we should be desiring and spending time together, especially as the assembling of ourselves together, which is the local church. All right. Now, this verse it's a great verse. I, I love this verse. You know, it, 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 any time, you know, before I was a pastor, any time that I felt like, ah, oh, I'm just tired, a bit tired today, I don't really feel like going to church, I would remind myself of this verse that I'm not to forsake the assembly of ourselves. But we must not misunderstand what this is teaching, okay? I know some pastors teach that if you miss a service, you know, unless like you're on your deathbed or something, but if you miss a service that you're, you forsook the assembly, you know, you're forsaking the assembly. You know, I've never held that view. I, I think that's, that's extreme. That's an extreme view. And one thing that I've been hearing is, you know, during these COVID-19 restrictions, because there have been times, you know, that we've not been able to have church for whatever reason, that, oh, that's forsaking the assembly. That is not, that's not the case, right? What is forsake? What does it mean to forsake something, right? I just did a dictionary uh, meaning for this. There's a few words that can go with forsake. It's to abandon, to leave, to renounce, or give up, okay? Now, if you're giving up on church, you know, you're forsaking church. You're renouncing church. You say, well, I don't like church anymore. That's not for me. I don't think I need to be there. You know, that's a waste of my time. I don't like it there. I'm never going to go to church again. That's forsaking the assembly. All right? Suspending church services because of COVID-19, whether you believe it's legitimate or not, that is not forsaken. All right? That's not forsaken. Listen, if people, we live in, we're living in strange days, brethren. Okay? Let's remember we're living in some weird days, some strange days. I don't believe it's the end times. There's been strange days in the past, okay, in throughout history, and we're just going through one of these strange moments. But, you know, if people have concerns about the virus, like if we have people that may not attend church because they're concerned that they may catch it, you know, they may have respiratory issues and they're concerned for their welfare and they don't come, God bless them. You know, I have, you know, I, I bless them. And if that's their decision, praise God. You know, they need to do what's right for them, between them and God and their family. I know they're not forsaken. I know they're not renouncing. I know they're not giving up. They're hoping that in due time when that re- things return to some normality, that they'll be back in church. Okay. And if some brethren are concerned about, you know, big brother, they're concerned about what, you know, the government may do and they decide not to be in church for that reason, well, you know what, brethren, that's your call. That's your decision. You know, if it makes you uncomfortable. You know, recently, just this past week, and I haven't done the videos yet, which I'm going to do uh, probably tomorrow now. It's been a bit busy. But, you know, uh, t- in order to have church services, you, you've got in down in ch- New South Wales, it's, it's not the same requirement here in Queensland. You've got to register as a COVID safe business. And the threat is if you don't register as a COVID safe business, that, you know, if you run your business, and look, I know church is not a business in that sense. Hey, but even Jesus says that he w- went about his father's business. And so, you know, yes, church is us being busy. We are doing something for the Lord, right? We're not being idle. But anyway, uh, you know, we were to register as a COVID safe business. And if we didn't, you know, I had a look. I thought it was 11000 It's $55,000 fine or even up to six months imprisonment. So either we, we do that, we register, and we can have church services as we have been doing, or we don't register and we don't have church services. I mean, which one do you want? You know? And so, but if you've got concerns about that, if you've got concerns about some document, our church name being somewhere on some internet list, and you decide not to attend church, I understand where you're coming from. Like, if that's a concern, we're living in strange days, 
don't come to church, just stay home, you know, keep yourself safe, whatever it is that you're concerned about, you know, I'm not going to think ill of you, I'm not going to think bad of you, all right? And so, you know, when it comes to this idea of forsaken, you know, again, we're, we're to provoke one another unto love and good works, okay? We're not there to criticize one another. Oh, so brother so-and-so, or sister so-and-so is not doing it the way I want to do it. That's, that's wrong. That's the wrong attitude, okay? That's you provoking people to frustration, to anger, you know, cause, uh, sowing discord amongst the brethren. We don't need that in our church, okay? There's enough discord, discord in this world. There's enough division in this world. You know, if you want division, if you want the fight, go and fight in the world. In the house of God, though, there ought to be some unity, okay? And so let us consider one another. And listen, if you think in your heart that maybe Pastor Kevin is starting to forsake the assembly for whatever reason, you know, I, I just let me, let me remind you why I'm going down to Sydney in October, right? I'm going down for 12 months, as you know. I don't care if it's at the height of COVID-19. I'm going to be there. One of the key things I want to do at Blessed Brothers Church, as I've already preached, is to go from two services to three services, right? As we see the day approaching, we ought to be gathering ourselves together more, all right? So that is where my heart is, and I hope you guys are able to support that decision as well. All right, Hebrews chapter 12 now. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. So there's a let us. And the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience. Actually, there's another let us. Oh, there we go. Let us run. I didn't, I didn't notice that one. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Okay? Run with patience. Now, he, what this is teaching, brethren, is that the Christian life is a race. Jesus Christ has put us on the starting line when we got saved, and is like, race, all right? Move forward, you know, run. It's a race, brethren, okay? And so the race, though, is a marathon. The race is many years. The race is till the day you die, okay? Or we see the rapture, whatever takes place first, okay? Don't forget, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. It said, let us run with patience, Okay, when someone's sprinting, okay, it's not a patient race. Okay, a marathon though is a patient race. Okay, you've got to time yourself, you've got to sometimes run faster, sometimes you've got to slow down. But this is the thing that you need to understand no matter what speed you're running, as long as you're going forward, that's the main thing. Okay, when you start running backwards, backsliding, that's that's wrong. Okay, that's that's a sin, that's not what we should be doing. We should be running forwards. Okay. And brethren, if, you've, if you're running at, at a sprint and you're getting exhausted, you're becoming weary, slow down. I'm just telling you, you know, run with patience. Slow down as long as you're going forward for the Lord, as long as you're serving the Lord, that's the most important thing, okay? Now, when it comes to this race, though, it said, let us lay aside every weight, okay? Now, when it says every weight here, it's not talking about sin, okay? Because then it says, and the sin which doth easily beset us, okay? So, there are sins that beset us and there are weights that be said us that these weights are not sinful in of themselves, okay? Now, some people will, will read this and go, well, let us lay aside every weight. All right, you know, in order for me to serve God, I'm going to quit my job. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, you know, uh, my hobbies and, and the things that interest me and, and the things that I'm learning. I'm just going to lay aside everything. If it's not serving God, if it's not soul winning, if it's not reading my Bible, just, just running that race, you know, sprinting that race, I'm just going to lay that aside. You know, my family's getting in my way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, divorce my wife and my kids because I can do more for the Lord. And I'm going to lay everything aside. That's not what it's teaching, okay? Laying aside every weight. What weight? What weights are we to lay aside? Now, listen, we all have certain weights, okay? But what weights are we to lay aside? Every, every weight <coughs> and, let's read it again, and the sin, so there are sins, which doth easily beset us, okay? So, look, first of all, sins will beset. What, what does beset mean? It's another way of saying to be besieged, okay? So if an uh, army were to, you know, uh, besiege a city, you know, in, in war times or something like this, the idea that uh, that city would be surrounded, okay? And it would prevent the, the, the citizens of that city from moving, okay? It prevents them, uh, it, prevents, it prevents movement, okay? And what is a race? Is, is a race standing still or moving? It's moving forward, right? And so there are certain things that will prevent us from moving forward, okay? And of course, sin is something that will stop us from moving forward, okay? But then there are other things that will stop us from moving forward. There are certain weights laid aside every weight that easily beset us. Those things that prevent you from serving the Lord, those things, yes, lay them aside, you know? So, for example, if you're not faithful to church, 
You know, if you're someone that's not faithful to Bible reading, not faithful to soul winning, not faithful to Christian fellowship, not faithful to prayer, just for some examples of things that we need to do in our Christian life. And, and the reason you're not faithful for those things is because something's stopping you doing it, okay? Well, that, and that might not be a sin that's stopping you from doing it, but that weight, you need to lay it aside. You need to say, this is not helping me in my Christian race. I need to lay that aside. You know, if you're like, well, I can't come to church on Sunday because I've got to go to the gym. I can't go to church because, I don't know, whatever, whatever thing might come up, right? It might not be a sin of itself, right? Nothing wrong with, with, you know, working out your body and being healthy and being strong. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's stopping you from serving the Lord, from, from being faithful to the things God wants you to be faithful in, then that's a weight that you need to set aside, okay? So that's what it's teaching. Now, there are other hobbies. There are other things that you may have, things that you enjoy. You know, praise God. But if you're still faithful to church and soul winning and reading your Bible and praying and, and uh, what else? You know, just all those fundamental things. If you're still faithful and you're, you're running the race of God, but you also have some other things that you like doing, some other activities, they're not be setting you in the race. Well, praise God for those things. You know, you don't need to lay those things aside. Okay, it's not laying aside everything and only, you know, uh, you know giving up everything and, and only... Uh, running the race okay so let's move on now let's go to verse number 28 in the same chapter hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 it says here wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear okay so what is grace you know i've been in church most of my life and i think the main definition given to grace is undeserved merit and i, I like that definition that might not be the first definition that you find in your dictionary, but I, I do like that in context, especially of salvation. For by grace are you saved. Hey, it's undeserved merit, right? I did nothing to deserve my salvation, you know, but God showed His grace toward me. But grace also means goodwill toward others, okay? And so in many ways, yeah, by God showing grace toward us, He, sh he has shown goodwill toward undeserving sinners, right? And so, when it's talking about here, let us have grace, okay, this is not talking about let us have the grace of God. I mean, I, that's important, right? We should have the grace of God, but it's about us having grace toward others, okay? Let us have grace, right? And so, to really understand this a little bit further, let's stay to this in the same chapter. Let's move up a little bit further up. We're in verse number 14, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14, it says this, <clears throat> follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, okay? So, God's instructing us to have peace with all men, okay? Look at verse number 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So, you know what? What it's saying here, that if you don't seek peace, if you don't seek holiness... Okay, if you're not looking diligently, if you're not watching, you're not being careful about the things affecting your life, that you can fall of the grace of God. Now, it's not saying that you can lose your salvation. Again, many idiots will teach you st stupid things like this, right? That's not what it's teaching us, right? Because what happens if we fall or fail out of, out of the grace of God here? It says, lest any root of bitterness spring it up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What it's saying here, if we don't seek peace with men, if we don't seek holiness, if we're not being careful and diligent, okay, we can fail in the grace of God and you're going to become a bitter person, okay? If you're someone that struggles with bitterness about something someone has done, well, guess what? In order for you to get over that bitterness, you better start showing some grace toward that person. You've got to move on, okay? Bitterness is, a, is a, such a, a, a weird sin because it makes you feel a little bit better. Oh, I'm angry at this person. I'm bitter toward this person. And somehow you think that person's being affected by your bitterness, but the person you're bitter toward, like if you're bitter toward me as your, you know, as your pastor, look, I'm enjoying life. I'm going back by every day. You know, I'm really, you know, I've, I've never had a better life, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, I'm enjoying every day of my life. I'm enjoying my family. I'm enjoying church. I'm enjoying this live stream, you know, and someone might be bitter toward me. It doesn't affect me. All it does is affect you if you're bitter. Because look, it says there, uh, lest any root, uh, roots of bitterness springing up trouble you. It's the, the bitter person is troubling himself, right? That's what it's saying there, troubles you. But not only this, if, especially in the context of church, if you have bitter people, if you have frustrating bitter people, it says here, and thereby many be defiled. 
Okay, so we need to come to church and have grace. You know, we need to seek to have peace amongst the, the, the brethren there, okay? You know, be gracious. If someone says something to upset you, maybe they forgot to greet you, maybe they forgot to say goodbye to you, you know, don't become bitter. Just have a bit of grace. Maybe they forgot, all right? Or, you know, what? who am I anyway? I'm just a sinner saved by grace, all right? I mean, you know, have some grace for, toward other people. Don't become bitter because if you become bitter, especially in church, and I've seen this, I'm, I've seen this, where it starts to affect many. It starts to defile many people in the church and all of a sudden, church splits, you know, church arguments, all these things happen. And so let us have grace. Let's go to chapter 13 now, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 13. Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll read verse number 12 first and then 13. Let's read verse number 12. Let's get the context here. It says, Wherefore, <coughs> Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, let me explain that to you. I remember when I read this the first time, I didn't understand what it was teaching. Suffered without the gate is basically saying he suffered outside of the gate, okay? And of course, you know the story of Jesus Christ. He was arrested, brought into the city of Jerusalem. He was, uh, false accusations were made about him. He was beaten. He was whipped, okay? And uh, then he was taken outside of the gate of Jerusalem, outside of the gates, okay? Jerusalem has multiple gates, right? But he was taken outside of the gate of Jerusalem, and then he was crucified on Calvary. Okay, so this is what he's teaching us here about the, uh, the sanctification of his blood. He suffered without the gates. He, he suffered outside of the gates of Jerusalem, right? And then it says here in verse number 13, let us go, uh, let us go, there's another, oh yeah, there it is. Let us go forth. Okay, so now there's an issue to us. In light of what Christ has done, there's a let us go. Let us go forth, therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So, in the same way, just like Jesus was outside of the gates, it's asking, let us go forth to Christ outside of the camp. Why is it saying outside of the camp now? Because the old, the, uh, old sin offering that was made uh, by the Old Testament Israelites, uh, after they, they did the burnt offering, they would take the, the, uh, the fat of the animal, the dung, I think the skin as well from memory, and they would take that outside of the camp and they will burn that to, the, to a crisp. Okay? They would take it outside of the camp, outside, outside right? Okay? And, and that was a picture of Christ being taken outside of Jerusalem to be crucified on the cross. And Christ has done that for us. And now it's saying, will you do that for Christ? Say, what? Okay, well, let's keep reading, right? It says there in verse number 14, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So let's not forget the context, right? So Jesus was a reject. It's what it's saying, okay? He was a reject to the world. He was a reject. He was rejected by the Jews, right? The Jews did not count the, him as their own, right? And so he was not of the world. And neither should we be of the world. We should also say, hey, you know what? We have no continuing city. You know, I, I, yeah, I live in Australia. Yeah, I live in the Sunshine Oh, you live in Sydney. I live in the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, but this is not our continuing city. This is not the city that we're going to live for for all eternity. We have New Jerusalem. That's our continuing city for all eternity. That's the city that we ought to live for. And so, and I taught this uh, here on Sunday. If you haven't heard the sermon, I recommend 1 Peter chapter 2. I preached this here at, at, uh, at New Life Baptist Church. Uh, what, what did I call it? I can't remember right now. But anyway, I really recommend you to listen to that because basically I'm I've taken this whole point, let us go forth as a whole sermon, okay? And it, it will give you greater depth. But please now go to John chapter 17. I want you to go to John chapter 17 and verse number 14. John chapter 17 and verse 14. Say, Pastor Kevin, why are you not overly concerned about, you know, our rights being taken away and, and the virus and all this stuff? Because this is not my continuing city. I'm not living for this world. I don't care. Okay, I care for the souls. I don't care for the wickedness. I'm not worried about those things. I understand things are going to get worse. The Bible already tells me this. I don't need to be reminded every day on Facebook, every day on YouTube, how bad this world gets. The Bible's already told me that. Okay? In fact, God does not want me to, to be wasting my time on these things. He wants me to be thinking about things that are lovely, things that are true, you know, things that are of good report. You know? But anyway, John chapter 17 and verse number 14 says, these are the words of Jesus, I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them. Listen, brethren, one thing you need to learn as a Christian, <laughs> you know, you learn this over time, is that the world hates Christians. I'm talking about true Bible-believing uh, believers of Jesus Christ, okay? And then it says this, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, okay? So just like Jesus, the picture of him being crucified outside of the gates, that rejection is not of the world, neither are we. Because if we're in Christ, neither are we part of this world, okay? And then in verse number uh, 15, 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So even though we're not of this world, Jesus does not want us totally removed from this world. You know, we're called to do a work here. You know, we're, we're a salt and a light to this world. Verse number 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Okay? So that kind of helps us understand, illustrate, or, you know, the point there in, in Hebrews chapter 13, how Jesus suffered outside of the gate. Yes, he did that for our, our sins, but it was a picture of his rejection of the world. He's not of this world, neither are we. And we should be happy to not be part of this world. We should be bearing that reproach of Christ. You know, suffer. He suffered for us. Hey, you know, he's not asking us to suffer anything near what he has suffered for us, okay? Now, back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 15. I'm up to my last let us, okay? Thank you for your patience. I hope you're patient. All right. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, verse 15. It says here, By him, therefore, let us, let us, there it is, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Okay? Let us offer the, the sacrifice of praise. And then it says here, that is, what is the sacrifice of our praise? That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Okay, this is why church is so important because this is one of the places that many, you know, many people do not really sing praises to God, right, at home. Now you should, you know, and if you don't, I encourage you, get a hymn book. You should have one anyway. You've all got one. I think all the family's there. Please sing the praises with your family, okay? This is a, a, a sacrifice. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise. We ought to be praising God. We ought to be giving Him thanks. When He answers your prayers, give Him thanks. When He gives you a blessing, give Him, give him thanks. When you get your paycheck, give God thanks. These things have come from God. He's allowed you to have a job and, and earn what you earn, okay? Give God thanks, all right? Give praise to His name. But look at verse number 16. There's another sacrifice that's well-pleasing to God. It says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. Okay? For with such sacrifices, God is well-pleased. Now, when it says here to do good and communicate, communicate is basically fellowship. Okay? This is talking about your, your brothers and sisters. Okay? To do good and to communicate or fellowship, forget not. Don't forget to spend time with the brethren. All right? This is also a sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. All right. Now, you know, as I said, you know, there are different reasons why people come to church. And look, there's been times, and, and you know, I've made this mistake in the past. Well, I, I didn't fully understand church. I didn't fully understand what it is that I'm offering there. You know, I thought I'd just go sit down, put some money in the plate, and listen to some preaching, and go home, right? What I found <laughs> over time, you know, growing as a Christian, is that I was enjoying more and more the fellowship with my fellow brethren. Okay, I was enjoying that more and more. There was a time where I would just go to church, sit there, as I said, Straight out of the service, I'd be, I'd be gone. You know, if someone said, where's, where's Kevin? He's gone. <laughs> I, I, was completely, I, I was not interested in fellowshipping with people. But you know what? This is part of our sacrifice to God. You know, when we're fellowshipping with the brother, the body of Christ, if, when we serve one another, when we spend time with one another, when we care for each other, it's as though we're doing it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So it says there, but to do good and communicate, forget not. Don't forget to fellowship, you know, and if you're someone that runs off after service as soon as you can because you don't want to fellowship with people, you need to fix that about yourself, okay? <laughs> Let us offer the sacrifice, okay, of praise, yes, praise to the Lord, but also the sacrifice of fellowship with one another. All right, brethren, that's what I've got for you today. Those are all the let us in the book of Hebrews, and hopefully, Lord willing, that, uh, you know, services return back to normal on Sunday. All right, God bless.